morning. Oh my god, it's loud. Hi, I know you. It's good to see you. I don't mean to point you out, but can't help it. Anyway, if you would, come in and have a seat. We're going to do things a little bit differently this morning. We are going to uh, play a short video to uh, honor our veterans. Uh, if you have or currently have or currently are, would you please stand? If you're a veteran or currently are serving in our military, will you please stand? We want to thank you for your service and your sacrifice. Will you get the lights, please? That was awesome. Well, it's good to see your smiling faces this morning, and if you're not smiling, you should. That wasn't me. All right. Uh, announcements. Um, this afternoon, right after service, and to get you a little bit more excited, I'm hoping that my message is only 45 minutes long. Yeah, I know. <laughs> but as soon as service is over, if you can stay for... 20, 30, 10 minutes, I don't care. If you can help set up, we are having um, the Fuller's Memorial Service immediately following service, and we need help getting stuff set up. The more people that help, the less time it will take. Um, also, Pastor Annette asked me to ask uh, if there is anybody that has a military ID that can pick up Rudy's Barbecue in Colleen, um, please let us know because they get a substantial discount and it will help cut the cost of um, doing this. So if you can do that or are willing to do that, please see Pastor Rick. Um, and then also there will be no classes this evening. Um, and then also there will be no baptisms following service. The baptisms, if you were scheduled for that, uh, it will be next Sunday. Um, the 18th and the 19th is the uh, Men That Move God Conference. Um, if you are interested in going, please register online. If you don't know how to do that, see Pastor Rob or see that man right there, uh, and they will help get you registered and get you more information. Uh, and then Sunday, November 20th is um, Intro to the Point, 
If you have not been and you are interested in going, please see Pastor Nona, and she will get you registered. Uh, that is a time where the pastors just share their heart of where the church came from, where it is now, and where it's going. Uh, we try to do that so you can feel more connected uh, with what's going on here so that you're not clueless. Uh, and they also give you pizza. That's always a plus. Um, and that is about it. Is there anything else I'm missing? No? No. Good. Um, so I want to share something with you real quick that uh, the Lord shared with me during intercessory prayer. Um, if you've been coming here for the past few weeks, especially since the stirring, we've been hearing the phrase, the currency, the new currency is mercy. And what I heard the Lord say today is that a lot of us, need to do a currency exchange. We need to exchange maybe some of the resentment or bitterness or things that have just been stirring up with all the stuff that's going on, and we need to exchange that for mercy so that when we come in contact with people, we're not giving them the junk. We're giving them mercy. We're giving them grace. Um, who's got Nugget? You. Come up here, please. And while she's doing that, uh, if you would, please get your tithe and your offering ready. And uh, I'm going to have Lori pray over it. You can't make that face. Jeez. Father, we thank you for today, Lord, and thank you for um, everything you've given us. Thank you again, Lord, for all those who have sacrificed so much um, to protect this country and to make it the awesome country that it is. Lord, we also thank you that we have the opportunity to give back to you in a way of worship and to understand that it's not our own, but it's yours. So it's really, it was never ours to begin with, Father. So thank you that we can give to you and that it's your will as to what happens to it, Father, and let us um, enjoy that moment of praise that we get to give to you right now. And it's in your holy name. Amen. Okay. Got me all emotional with the video. Um, so uh, a few... I guess this summer, I started reading a book by Lisa Bevere, I think that's how you say her name, and uh, called Lioness Arising. And, you know, we had had our women's conference, and we were all about being lionesses and stuff, and I've had lioness stuff spoken over me before, so it was, I really wanted to read it, and I've kind of read it in chunks and kind of go back about what I've read, and I'm spreading it out. Well, there was this one part where she was talking about, it was a personal experience where she had decided that she was going to go to the gym and start getting, you know, back in shape. She wasn't overweight or anything, just she kind of had this vision of her. And um, so she went in, she had this trainer, and just doing the first kind of setup, and um, she wasn't able to do a lot of the stuff she thought she would have been able to do as far as lifting the weights and some of the exercises. And then he did her um, body fat percentage, and it was really high. And she even had him do it again. It was like, something's wrong with the machine. That's not right. And he was like, no, it's right. He's like, and he told her, he said, you're what we call skinny fat. And my first reaction in the physical was, oh, crap, that's me. <laughs> because I can't do a lot of the stuff I used to do. And I've actually had people be like, how do you stay in shape? I'm like, I'm not in shape. Um, I'm not at all. And so my first reaction was all fleshly, like, great, I'm willing to close the book and not read anymore because I was like, I don't really care what the spiritual implication is. I don't like the physical implication of this. But I kept reading, and she, of course, took it into a spiritual way. But then um, a while back, I was thinking about it again, probably thinking that I need to work out. And God actually gave me kind of a different revelation of it and um, how we see other people spiritually. And that, um, you know, we, we're in a training ourselves. We're training for a battle. We are called to run a race. And so many times spiritually we're not doing that. And we look the part, but we don't have the spiritual fruit and stamina that we need to actually run that race and do what we're called to do. And a lot of times we base our opinion of others spiritually on their maturity on the outside things that we see when we don't really know their inside fruit. You know, we see people in, they're up here with a microphone or they're doing certain things, when you, and we think, wow, they've got it all together. They, they're really mature. They're running the race. They're in shape. But really, what is the fruit of what they're doing? Okay? And 
on our own lives. You know, a lot of times we think that we don't have it together. I can't go up there and do that. I'm not mature of them. I'm not as in shape as they are. But really, you're spending your time with God, and you're doing that quiet time, and you're doing what he's told you to do, and you're a lot more in shape spiritually than what you may think. And so my challenge was just to be, first of all, don't look at the outside. I'm not talking physical, but on the outside spiritually of what you think, oh, they've got it all together, or they don't have anything together. There's no way that they're hearing God right now. Look at that. Look at how they are. When really we don't know the stamina that they have and the work they're putting into it behind the scenes. And he reminded me of when Jesus cursed the fig tree. Because it had an outside showing that it had produced fruit. It had leaves. It was showing I've produced fruit. And then he went up to it and there was no fruit. That's why he cursed the fig tree. So my challenge is let's make sure that we're not looking on the outside spiritual things, but really looking on the inside and look at yourselves. Are you really running that race? Are you doing what you need to do to build that stamina to be able to produce the weight of the things that he's called you to do? Makes you want to check your gut. Oh, I'm good. Good. <clears throat> really, it just sticks out too far. If you would, please stand. Father, I thank you for this, this time we get together, together corporately. Father, to, to worship you and to lift praises up to you. Father, this is your time. This is not our own. And Father, I pray this morning that, that we, we make an exchange with you. Father, that we accept your mercy and we extend it to those who we think aren't even worthy of it. Because at one point in our lives, we weren't worthy of it. Father, we want you to come and absolutely have your way. Holy Spirit, we want you to come and absolutely invade our hearts. We don't want to put on a show for you. We want to love you unabandonedly with no restrictions. So, Father, I pray that as we come, we choose to lay down our junk. We choose to take off our guard. And we just love you openly. In Jesus' name, amen.
deep inside it's overflowing from the heart of God the flood of heaven crashing over us the tide is rising rising there is a current stirring deep inside it's overflowing from the heart of God the flood of heaven crashing over us the tide is rising rising come on tell him bursting Come on, every voice, break open. 
first and we talked about how it made us come alive and it's not us it's because it's him it's because he is a flowing constant current what happens when the wave of his mercy and his grace just flows from one end of the earth to the next come on pray it in pray it in it's the obedience it's the remnant come on that releases him in a greater measure come on Spirit like we never 
never seen before and every eye will look and see the glory of the coming of the Lord. Come on, every voice. Tsunamis of revival now are crashing on the shores. A movement of the spirit like we've never seen before. And every eye will look and see the glory of the coming of the Lord. Come on, can we, can we release it? Tsunamis of revival now crashing on the shore a movement of the spirit like we've never seen before and every eye will look and see the glory of the coming of the lord come on body let's do it together tsunamis of revival now crashing on the shore of the spirit like we've never seen before and every eye will look and see the glory of the coming of the lord come on just keep releasing it this morning close your eyes let it out tsunamis of come revival on. now are crashing on the shore come on let the eye know we're serious Shaking off the dust as we arise. Awake, awake, you got generation cries. Salvation songs will sing throughout the earth. And every eye will see your matchless worth. 
And I can feel the drum of your heartbeat Causing us to be your hands and feet Rising up with courage in our hearts To carry out your love to the heart to prove that he cannot be stopped and history was changed upon the earth with victory you rescue all that's lost silence and silence will be broken with our lives as we live out the love of Jesus have seen our hearts cannot ignore we'll lead this generation to the glory of the Lord so take courage the harvest is right lift up your voice it's Jesus is alive
bow their heads I'm sitting here listening to the songs and kind of having a small conversation with the Lord and reaching out to some people and we got a lot, of pe- a lot of people out, and of course, it concerns me. <clears throat> I didn't even want to come this morning. There's this overwhelming thing of I'm tired, I'm exhausted. You don't know my personal life. But between the church and my own personal life, it's been nonstop for two years. I'll just come out of one battle and I'll, I'll be right into another. I'd come out of something and then yesterday another thing hit. It's been that way. And I'm, I'm not exaggerating. I'm not... I'm not making it more for effect. I'm being perfectly honest with you. And I think there's a lot of people in here that way. But as I'm, I'm listening to the Lord, and He's showing me that Satan doesn't stop he doesn't give up and when we concede just a little bit we think okay if I just concede in this area if I'll just do this if I do whatever it is if I'll just do this then it will ease up and it will be okay and I'll, I'll be all right but Satan doesn't stop there he goes for the next thing And then he goes for the next thing. 
Because he doesn't want to just take a little bit. He wants to consume you. He wants to completely destroy me. He wants to completely destroy you. He wants to completely destroy this church. He wants to completely destroy all the work that's been done. And the only way that it stops is if we fight back. We cannot just sit idly by and let it go and think it, it, will, it will pass over. It's not going to pass over. We have to rise up. We have to gird up. And we have to link up. And together, we've got to encourage each other, help each other, and build each other up to fight. Because I don't know about you, I don't want everything that I've done to go to waste. In my personal life, in my family, and in this church or in this ministry. And you may not be worried about the ministry. You may only be worried about yourself. And I'm not, I'm not condemning you for that. Yet that's your life right now. But know that this people in here, there's, there's a select few I know will stand beside you no matter what. But I'm asking you to come alongside and let's fight. Let's step up. Let's press in. Let's press forward. And let's get what God has for us. Amen? And I, I, that's, that was weak. And I know, I, I know it's just, oh, I know it's overwhelming. This church has never been this rattled. Since we started, we've never been this rattled. It tells me one or two things. Either we were not meant to be or we really have something to do just on the other side. So with all that you got and all that you are, let's ask the Holy Spirit to fill this place. Go ahead.
I've tasted and seen. Thank you.
Can you join hands, please? Dear Heavenly Father, I come to you today, and I just ask, Father, that as we join hands as a sign, a prophetic sign, Father God, of unity, I just ask, Father God, that we begin to multiply like cells, Father God, that as we touch one another, we begin to grow eternally, Father God, uh, that we would grow spiritually, uh, growing uh, fonder and more endearing in love with you, Father, but also that we would multiply, that we would reach out to those that are sick, those that are wounded, those that are hurting, those that have strayed, Father God, and bring them back into the fold. Father, you are worthy of all praise, honor, and glory. And all God's people said, amen Amen and amen. Turn to your neighbor and give them a big old hug and tell them you're glad they are here today. Again, the good-looking man in the suit, thank you, got the lights. Holy Spirit. Uh, Mike, well, up or down? Down. All right. God is good. Amen? Okay, uh, after I gave my little speech, the Holy Spirit uh, kind of jerked my chain, and um, he said, no, this is not the worst that it, 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 attack that has been. And uh, he said, it's just that you are in uh, the worst position you've ever been in. So uh, <laughs> I like to air out my dirty laundry for some stupid reason. Uh, but um, I, part of this going on is my fault, so I apologize. Uh, I promise I will get my head out of my rear. Actually, it's been removed. It's just cleaning it up right now, okay? What? TMI, amen. It's the truth. It is what it is. That's right. God is good no matter how we feel. And God is on the throne no matter what we think. And God is still in control no matter who's in the White House. And even if your candidate won, doesn't mean that he's right. And even if your candidate lost, doesn't mean that they are, are, are wrong or completely right are wrong. Both of them had a lot of issues, right? And uh, I heard a statement this morning about equivalent. They were making his, I I don't understand where they get racism racism from him, but uh, the the comments that he makes uh, are very strong. But they, they talk about people making them equal between what his comments and what she did with her emails and lying to the public. And um, in my opinion, they both have value. They both have weight. And they both have consequences. I mean, if your heart is to stop people from coming in and destroying this this country is one thing, but the way you say it needs to be guarded in the way you communicate it. Because all Muslims are not bad. It's only those Muslims that uh, want to destroy and kill our nation. But if you communicate where it sounds like it's all Muslims, you're going you're gonna to turn people away. Amen? And uh, uh, if, if you are doing everything you can in your position to bring money to your, to your family, people are going to catch you. Right? So... Uh, I said all that to say this. Nothing's going to change in this country if we keep looking to the government to make the change. The only way that we're going to stop abortion is that we get people saved and they don't want to kill their babies, no matter how the baby came. Do you know James Robinson was a a victim of rape? He's a rape baby. The only way that we're going to change greed, the only way we're going to change social issues is by getting people saved. The only 
kingdom that works, the only economy that works, is the kingdom of God. Amen? And the only way that we're going to do it is one person at a time. Stop focusing on the big picture. Focus on one person at a time. As we change people one person at a time, we will change this country. Amen? All right, would you all give Michael a hand as he comes forward to preach? with your text. Hear me now? Good. All right. Well, it's good to see you all again. Uh, I dressed up for you. The, the, the last time I ministered was in Gatesville, and uh, I wore tennis shoes, shorts, and a t-shirt. And you should have seen the look on its face. I thought I was going to give him an aneurysm. But it's not like I haven't done that before. But, uh, yeah. Billy knows. He can testify to that. Um, but it's good to see y'all. It's good to be back in Temple. I miss all of y'all dearly. I didn't know how much until I was gone. Um, but it's good to be back. Um, so anyway, um, I want to talk to you about connection. And I want to talk to you about choice. Um, and it's obviously something that's being talked about a lot, whether you realize it or not. Um, We are in a world right now that is absolutely disconnected and that you absolutely don't have a choice because if you don't make the right choice, you are shunned and you are disgraced and you are put down and so people are like, I don't want to choose anymore. And that was never God's intention. Um, God gifted us with the ability to choose, whether it be right or whether it be wrong. He gave us that ability. Um, And we we can see that uh, in Genesis. Uh, if you would go with me to Genesis chapter 2, um, starting in verse 7. It says, Then the Lord God formed the man from the dust of the ground. He breathed the breath of life into the man's nostrils, and the man became a living person. This is the first instance that God showed connection. He made us because he wanted to have connection. Did he need to? No. He had himself, he had, the, I mean, he had the Trinity, he already had connection, but he wanted something beyond himself. So he formed us and he fashioned us after himself because he wanted to have connection. And he wants us to have connection. And not just with him, but with everyone that we come in contact with, whether they be saved or unsaved, he wants us to have connection. Why? Because we are that drawbridge between the lost and between him. And if we disconnect ourselves from the world, how are they going to get to him? We are his representatives here on the earth, and if we disconnect ourselves from those who don't know him, how are they going to know him? And then choice. Genesis chapter 2, verse 9. It says, The Lord God made all sorts of trees grow up from the ground, trees that were beautiful and that protected delicious fruit, produced, Delicious fruit. In the middle of the garden, he placed the tree of life and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Well, why two trees? Why not just the tree of life? It would have made things so much more simpler if he would have just had that one tree. We would have never had the ability to choose. But why did God want us to choose? Because he wanted us to have free will. He didn't want to create us to have connection with him and not be able to choose. Even Satan himself was able to choose. He chose to disobey and rebel, and the choice or the consequences of his choice, we can see what happened. 
So why would God make us any different? Why would he not give us the ability to choose? For me, I would rather somebody love me because they choose to love me and not because they have to love me and not because they're ignorant that they have the choice to love me. So God get, made us to have connection and God gave us the ability to choose. So what's going on right now? Why is the world in the state that it's in? Because the church has lost connection. It's partly with God and, and partly with each other inside of the body and partly with the world that, he, that we're supposed to be a part of. Yes, it says we are in this world, we are not of this world, but that doesn't mean that we're supposed to be avoiding the world and everything that goes on in it. If we're his kingdom and we avoid the world, how is his kingdom going to be reestablished? How does that happen if we're not actively a part of it? If we're not actively making connection with people that don't know who he is? How, would, how did we come to know of who Jesus is if somebody didn't make a connection with us? How? We didn't just like get a brain fart and all of a sudden, oh, I need Jesus. Some of y'all made it happen that way. That's great for you, but for me, it took a connection. It took somebody telling me about who he is. It took somebody telling me who he was. It took somebody teaching me about who he was. And a lot of the disconnect has to do with the two trees. Mainly the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Because a lot of times when we talk to people about Jesus, that's the fruit that we give them. We give them the good and we give them the bad. And we try to tell them everything that they need to do without showing them how to do it. If I just tell you what to do, then you should be able to bypass all the junk that I've went through, and you should be good, and you should just be able to do it. But that's not the way that it always goes. It's good to share, and it's good to tell, but it's better to sit down with somebody, make a connection with them, and teach them. Not necessarily what's good and bad, but what brings life and what brings death. Because Jesus came to give us life. He didn't come to give us good and bad. So, I am a very visual person. And I, as I was going through this, I had this visual in my head of what it's like for a new believer to come in and for us just to tell them what's good and what's bad in their life. So, I want Billy to come up. Uh, Kurt, could you give me that chair, please? Just set it right there. Thank you. Jacob, will you bring me that trash can? So here we have Billy. And let's just pretend that, that Billy is a new Christian. And Billy has come into the church, and we just immediately throw him in the process. We don't ever really make a connection with Billy. We say hi, and we do all the, all the formalities of church. But we never take the time to learn about him, to know his likes and his dislikes. We never take the time to know why he even came here. We just immediately start shoving what we perceive as good and bad, hopefully that somehow on his own that he'll meet Jesus and that he'll just change. So, the marshmallows are the good and the bad. You can hold these. And so what are, what are, what are, what are some of the, the things that we tell people when they come into church? The things that they should be doing and they shouldn't be doing. And I'm going to go through the list, and if you want to add on to that, I will give you the opportunity, because every one that he does, he has to put a marshmallow in his mouth. And it's going to give you a visual of, of what... <laughs> it's going to give you an idea of what some people experience when they come into the church. So, what are the good things? Billy. 
you need to come to church every service, and you need to attend every class, and you need to attend every event. So that's like three marshmallows right there. I really dislike you. I know. That's why I picked you. Oh, here's some more. You need to read your Bible every day, and you need to have a secret quiet time every day. That's two. Oh, and then you need to pray without ceasing. You need to get involved with the ministry. You need to go to small groups, and then you need to get baptized. Oh, and you need to tithe. So that's like five right there. Anyone want to add anything else? Did I leave anything? I'm just trying to go by the, the standard. Fellowship. I'll let you not do that one. Say chubby bunny. <laughs> All right, you can hold off for now. No, you can't spit it out yet. So, so, you know, all of these things in their own regard are good. They're not necessarily bad things. But if I haven't taken the time to teach Billy why these things are good, why he should do them, what am I doing? I'm overwhelming him. I am choking, I am choking the life out of him. You're good. You're not dead yet. <laughs> so what are some of the bad things that we should tell Billy not to do in order to be holy? Let's see. Let's don't cuss. Don't be angry when you drive. Don't listen to worldly music. Don't wear that type of clothing. If you were a female, I'd say something else, but I can't. Um, don't dress up for Halloween, because if you do that, you're sacrificing your kids to Molech. Um, you shouldn't smoke. You shouldn't drink. Um, you shouldn't worship money. You probably shouldn't watch football, because that's worship, too. Because if you can come in here and you can't praise God and you watch football, then you're worshiping that. Anyone want to add anything else that we tell people that they shouldn't do because it's bad? Yeah, we shouldn't judge. You shouldn't be on social media. Because <laughs> that just takes up too much time, and that time you should be praying and finding God. So I can't really add anything more to him because of all the good stuff I told him, can I? It's okay, Billy. You'll find Jesus one day. But Billy, I'm not, I'm not done yet. There's still some more things that you need to do. Okay, well, you can't run from God. His real issue is, is he doesn't know how to submit to authority. That's the real problem. But see, you laugh. But these are the things that we tell people. And that's exactly what they do. They get overwhelmed and they leave. Let me ask you a question. You can be honest, you can be not. How many of you have invited people to church? And how many of those people are still here? Why aren't they here? Why aren't they still here? Is it because we've never really made a connection with them? Is it because we've tried to run them through this process? And we've overwhelmed them and they've said, I don't want anything to do with this church. I don't want anything to do with your God. Because the reality is, is some of the responsibility is on us. And some of it may be on them. Maybe we, we, with that one person, we did do the right thing, and they chose, I don't want this. See, when we make connection with people, when we spend time with people, real time, when we meet them at their place and not our own place, we develop a doorway to be able to speak into their lives. And not to be able to speak the good and the bad, but to speak about life. 
it gives us the opportunity to testify about what Christ has done in our lives. And that is our greatest asset. It's not how much Bible we can throw at them. It's not how much knowledge we have. It's not how much Christianology we can do. But our testimony relates to them more than anything else. What has Christ done in your life that will help them to understand what he wants to do in their life so that they can make a choice, so that they can choose life, or they can choose death? Taking the choice away doesn't guarantee salvation because eventually they're going to come to a point where I never really chose. I've just been doing this because they told me to do it and nothing's changed. As a matter of fact, everything has gotten worse. Why am I still here? Because we took away their choice. I chose Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior. I chose that. That was me. But it was his goodness that drew me into himself. It wasn't because of rules or anything else. It was his goodness. It was when I had that encounter with him myself, not because somebody told me I needed to, that I realized how depraved, how jacked up, messed up, screwed up I am. But he had something to offer me that no one else could. He had life. And when we look at that tree, excuse me a second, I forgot to pull up my phone. I had notes, then I left them at home. I don't want Zoe life yet. I want this life. That word life in Genesis, it means to live, whether literally or figuratively, causatively to revive, to keep life, to make life, to give life, to promise life, to nourish up, to preserve, to quicken, to recover, repair, restore, to live, to revive, to save, to be whole. See, God's intention all along was for us to have that life from the beginning. But Adam and Eve chose differently. And here we are now. And all of us who are in here have hopefully made a choice to follow after Christ. Not because of anything that any of us have said or anything any of us have done, but because somebody made a connection with you. And somebody took you back to that garden and said, hey, you know what? You get to choose. And hopefully it's because you had that encounter with the Savior himself, and he offered you life. A life that you could never create on your own, no matter how hard you tried. A life that even if you tried to create on your own, you kept messing up, you kept falling, you know, whatever it is. And you accepted that life that he offered. And you realized this is the most amazing thing ever. And then what does he want you to do? It's kind of like that song said, simple obedience. Go tell others about it. That's all I want you to do. Go tell others about it. Then make a connection with them. And if they have questions, answer those questions. But don't force yourself upon them. You know, it's real funny when when we get personal convictions about things that we should or we shouldn't do, then we think we need to go tell everybody else about those convictions. Because I can't do this now, you can't do this either. And I did that once, and it didn't turn out really well. When I was going to Teen Mania Ministries, they asked us if we were going there to not watch rated R movies. I was like, all right, no watching rated R movies. And what did I do? If anyone else said they were going to go watch a rated R movie, it was my obligation to tell them, you can't do that. And what did I do? I was trying to feed them false fruit. It was not life. It was life to me because I chose it, but they didn't choose it. They didn't choose to not do that. That, was, that wasn't for them. That was strictly for me. And I created separation. I cut off the connection because they didn't want to hear anything I had to say. Like, well, they're just, there's something wrong with them, obviously, if they don't want to listen to the man of God and what I have to say. There's something wrong with them. 
Or even when we become new Christians and we get the zeal and we just want to tell everybody everything. It's not a good idea. I got saved and I told my mom she was going to hell. To her face. And I was serious about it. It was bad fruit. And what did she do? She called Ricky and Annette. <laughs> and she asked them what they were teaching me. And I don't know the conversation that they had, but I got my butt chewed the next time I went to church. My heart was for my mom to not go to hell. It was just kind of what Pastor Rick said earlier. It was the delivery of it. I didn't present it to her as life. I presented it to her as the fruit of the knowledge of good and evil. And she couldn't digest it. It's kind of like giving a Camden a 32-ounce steak and shoving it in his mouth like I did with Billy. He's not able to digest it. We have to meet people on their level. Not that we have to dumb it down or try to take away from the meaning of it. But we have to learn to be practical in how we talk to people. I, had a, I was talking to Pastor Rob about this this morning. And, and, I, and I, saw, I saw a pool, and there were like three different levels of the pool. And everybody wants to be a lifeguard in the deep end. And the new Christians are in the shallow end, and we're just calling out to them, come, come, you know, come, you need to be here, you need to be in the deep end. And they don't know how to get there. And some of them may try, but they end up drowning because nobody took the time to teach them how to swim. We need lifeguards in the shallow end as well to make connection, to teach them. And then there's people like Pastor Rob who are stay in the deep end, because that's just where he lives, that's where God's called him to be. And as people transition, as they grow and they mature, we can essentially hand them off. And when Elder Rob, Pastor Rob makes a connection with them, they just go, Bruh. they go into the deep, the real, real, real deep. But what about those that are in the shallow end? God told me that's where you're supposed to be, is in the shallow end. Be practical in the way that you present the gospel. Make it in a way that they can understand. And I look, I look at the woman at the well. Actually, if you would, uh, go with me. Uh, John chapter 4. Go to the 6. So Jacob's well was there, and Jesus, tired from the long walk, sat rarely beside the well about noontime. Just keep going until I tell you to stop. Uh, soon a Samaritan woman came to draw water, and Jesus said to her, Please give me a drink. He was alone at the time because the disciples had gone into the village to buy some food. The woman was surprised, for Jews refused to have anything to do with Samaritans. She said to Jesus, You are a Jew, and I am a Samaritan woman. Why are you asking me for a drink. Jesus replied, If only you knew the gift God has for you and who you are speaking to, you would ask me, and I would give you living water. Let's stop right there. So let's relate this to us. We're supposed to be Jesus, and the Samaritan woman is somebody that God has told us to go speak to who isn't saved. And people wonder why. We don't talk to them. Why are you talking to me? You're, you're a Christian. You're not supposed to do this. Or we think to ourselves, because I'm a Christian, I can't talk to that person because they do this and they believe in that and so on and so forth, and we disconnect ourselves from them because we don't want anything to do with it. If I go talk to that person, I will become unholy. Whatever is on them may come on me. Or you hear people say they're a bad influence. And in my mind, I'm going, if you were a good influence, you would outweigh the bad influence. If you were spending time like you're supposed to be, the worldly things would not be able to influence you. Go to verse 11. But sir, you don't have a rope or a bucket, she said, and this well is very deep. Where would you get this living water? 
And besides, do you think you're greater than our ancestor Jacob who gave us this well? How can you offer better water than he and his sons and his animals enjoyed supper there? Jesus knows that what he has to offer is better. But he doesn't bulldoze her with that. He doesn't throw that on her. She lets her, he lets her speak. And as she's speaking, she's opening a door to allow him to present truth to her. To allow her to, to make a choice of what water she wants to actually drink out of. Because she, she already thinks she has a good water source. It does for her physical body what it needs to, but she doesn't understand that it does nothing for her spiritual body. She may not, in fact, even know that she's got a spirit man that's dead on the inside. But Jesus comes to her and he says, the water that I have to offer you is not like anything else you've ever tasted before. And is that the way that we present the water to people? Look, I know that what you have, what you think you have is good, but I can introduce you to somebody who has something better. What do you think? You give them the opportunity to choose. Uh, go to 13. <clears throat> Jesus replied, anyone who drinks this water will soon become thirsty again. But those who drink the water I give will never be thirsty again. It becomes a fresh, bubbling spring within them, giving them eternal life. Please, sir, the woman said, give me this water. Then I'll never be thirsty again, and I won't have to come here to get water. Go and get your husband, Jesus told her. I don't have a husband, the woman replied. And Jesus said, you're right. You don't have a husband. For you have had five husbands, and you aren't even married to the man you're living with now. You certainly spoke the truth. Stop right there. Jesus also made this connection with the woman through a word of knowledge and through a word of wisdom. He didn't just come to her and say, hey, I know you're junk and I know your business and I know what you're doing and you need to stop it now. He started with a question or with a statement. Hey, go get your husband and I'll give y'all both of this water. And she replies because she doesn't feel threatened or that she's going to be judged. Oh, I, don't, I don't have a husband. What does Jesus do? I know you don't have a husband. I already knew that because I know where you're at. And he offers her water, not condemnation, not guilt, but he offers her life. Go to verse 19. Sir, the woman said, you must be a prophet. So tell me, why is it that you Jews insist that Jerusalem is the only place of worship while we Samaritans claim it is here? I'll go to the next verse. Believe me, dear woman, the time is coming when you will no longer matter whether you worship the Father on this mountain or in Jerusalem. You Samaritans know very little about the one you worship while we Jews know all about him, for salvation comes through the Jews. But the time is coming indeed. It is here now, when true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth, the Father is looking for those who will worship him that way. For God is spirit, so those who worship him must worship in spirit and in truth. So we also see that this woman had kind of a basic understanding of what the Jews believed. And Jesus, being as awesome as he was, took that knowledge and he expounded on it. He didn't tell her that she was stupid or that she was wrong. He simply added more truth to it, giving her the opportunity again to come in. She could have argued and said blah, 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 whatever, but also because of him making that connection with her through prophecy, through that knowledge, through that wisdom that can only come from him, she knew that what he had to say had to be true. And so sometimes that's how we can make a connection with people. Is if we're spending time with the Lord, and he says, hey, this person is doing so and so and such and such. I want you to talk to him about it. He never gives us permission to go and condemn them and shake our finger at them and tell them that they're wrong. Because the motive should always be love. The motive should always be restoration. 
The motive should always bring to bring life where there's death, not bring good to where there's bad. And I also think it's, for me, when I look at this, I also think that Jesus was intentional about his connection. Like, he knew this woman was going to be there. And he made it intentional to stop at that well and to talk to this woman. And that's what God wants us to do, is to be intentional about making connections with people. He wants us to go meet them at the place where they feel like they're safe. That was her, to me, that was her safe place. She probably hid in her house during the rest of the day, was afraid to come out and be seen because of where she was at in her life. And that well was her safe place. And it stinks because it was the hardest part of the day, and I don't know how far it was from her town, but that was the one place where she go where she felt she could be safe. And Jesus didn't tear it down. He didn't take it away from her. He met her right there at that place. Do we do the same thing? Are we expecting people to come to us and meet us where we're at instead of meeting them where they're at? He made a connection. He gave her the opportunity to make a choice. And she chose life. She could have chosen the other way. And the other portion of this I, I thought was kind of funny. Was it why, why did Jesus wait to do it when the disciples weren't going to be there? And they probably had to have known that if this woman was there at this time of day, that there was something wrong with her, that she was probably in sin. And we all know that the disciples weren't like the sharpest tools in the shed. I mean, heck, they rebuked Jesus, and that's just really dumb. You don't rebuke Jesus. So I kind of, I kind of think that, you know, maybe they weren't there, and he did it without them there because he knew that if they were there, they may have opened their mouth and said, you can't talk to that lady. This is not the right time. This is not the right place. She's too dirty. She's too messed up. You should not have anything to do with her. And sometimes I put myself in the disciples' position. I can't talk to that person because they're too dirty, they're too messed up, and I don't want to separate myself from God. And that's not how it is at all. If we have life, if we truly, really believe that we have this life on the inside of us, there should be nothing that keeps us back from sharing that with people. So how, how do we make connection with people? Again, like Jesus did, we go meet them at their well. We be intentional about it. You know, I call people up who I haven't seen in a while, and I say, hey, let's go hang out. And I usually give them the option to choose. I want them to be comfortable. I don't want it to be what makes me comfortable. I'm not like, you just need to come back to church so we can hang out. They may not want to come here. So are we willing to go there? Are we willing to give of our time, to give of ourselves, and go meet them at a place that makes them more comfortable? Are we willing to do that? Social media is not making connection. I'm just going to tell you that right now. You posting a verse on your Facebook wall does not make connection with people because half the time the only people that like it are other Christians. The people that need him the most aren't going to like it. They're going to be going, oh God, they're posting another scripture. Who really cares? Because you don't have connection with them. Being friends with them on Facebook is not connection. And I'm going to be honest, even sending a text every now and then is not connection. It's something, but it's not connection. It's not real connection. Now, I, I, I'm going to say this. Pastor Rick is very vigilant about texting people and finding out where they are and where they're at. Because that one man by himself cannot be connected to every individual in this body. And we've put that labor on him. We bring people into the church and say, get connected, and then we basically just dump them off on him. And now that we have other pastors, we just dump them off on the other pastors and say, that's your job. You get them saved. You make the connection with them. I brought them in. My hands, I'm, I'm out. I don't want anything else to do with it. Because if, if something happens, I don't want the blame on me. Well, here's the reality. If you give people a choice and they choose you have no, almost no accountability in it at all. If you are presenting the truth in a manner that they can make a valid choice, it's not on you. It's on them.
But we think that if we can just tell them exactly everything that they should be doing, that they'll get it. And when they don't, we get butt hurt. Be honest with you. We're like, I can't do this anymore. I'm done with that person. I'm never talking to them again. You were never supposed to have that accountability on you in the first place. And we had to stop. It's not up to you to make the choice for them. It's up to them to make the choice. It's for us to lead them to that place where they can make that choice, where they can choose life, or they can choose death. It's up to the heart of the individual. In Psalms 9, verses 1 through 2, it says, I will praise you, O Lord, with my whole heart. I will tell of your marvelous works. I will be glad and rejoice in you. I will sing praise to your name, O Most High. Simple obedience. I will tell of your marvelous works. So simple, so easy to do. What has God done in your life? And then just go tell somebody about it. And then connect with them. Have a relationship with them. Another question. How many of you have let's say three or four more friends who aren't necessarily saved that you talk to on a regular basis. And if you don't, why don't you? Because that's who we're supposed to be reaching. It's not enough just it's somebody I work with, but we should have intentional connection with people who are lost, who aren't saved. Otherwise, how are they going to know? Oh, well, I have all these Bible verses in my cubicle. Who cares? Do you think they really take the time to stop by there and read every single Bible verse? You know that song that says, Tsunami waves, it's coming like we've never seen before. If we've never seen it before, how are they going to know? They have no clue. How are they supposed to know? Because of us. If we don't make that connection, if we don't take them to it and let them make the choice, how are they going to know? It's going to go way over their head. And then that is on us. Because we didn't do our simple obedience part. I want you to hear my heart. This is not a beat up message. It's kind of like Pastor Rick said. We, we have a responsibility. This world is broken. It is disconnected. And we're told that if you make a choice that's not what we think you should do, there is something wrong with you. You're, now I've seen people calling, if you voted for Trump, you're a racist, bigot, blah, 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 whatever, whatever, whatever. And I'm like, really? I'm not those things at all. Even if I didn't vote for him, I'm not those things at all. I and mean, if you voted for Hillary, you're not a liar and a murderer and all these other things that she's been accused of. You're not that at all. You made a choice based off the information that was given you. And that is your right as an American citizen. That's your choice. So my encouragement to you is to A, make connection with people inside of this church. I mean real connection. Connection outside of small group. Connection outside of Sunday and Wednesdays, that we live life together. Because the Bible says, they'll know you're my disciples by the way you love one another. Yeah. First and foremost. And then secondly, start making connections with people who aren't here. And start testifying to them about his goodness. Because there's a lot of death out there right now. And people have no hope People are terrified, they're scared, they don't know what's going on. And if we stay silent, if we fall back asleep as a church just because Trump won, we've done nothing. We may have prayed that he would win or whatever, we actually haven't accomplished anything. We're falling right back asleep, and that's not what God wants. It took a shaking like this to get us to come awake. We need to stay awake. We need to stay vigilant. We need to stay active. Now is not the time to fall back asleep. Now is the time to rise up and to do what we're called to do. You know, I talked to, I talked to Pastor Rob about this this morning. You know, we talk about the five-fold ministry in the church and how it's been missing. 
Well, the fivefold ministry has been missing outside of the church as well. You know, just because you don't hold the office of apostle, prophet, pastor, teacher, or evangelist doesn't mean that you aren't to operate in those things outside of these four walls. Because God is going to send you somewhere. God is going to have you speak into somebody's life and maybe even prophesy to them. God is going to want you to pastor people that he's set in your lives. He's going to want you to teach them. He's going to want you to evangelize to them. You don't have to have the office in order to do it. And it's not the office's responsibility inside of the church to do it all. It falls on all of us. I don't care who you are. I don't care if you think you're not supposed to or not, or I'm just, I just take out the trash, or I just sing on the worship team. No. What you do in here does not necessarily mean what you do out there. We're all supposed to do. All of us. We're all supposed to help carry the burden. We're all supposed to help carry the mantle. We're all supposed to help carry the calling. It falls on all of us. And the more of us that do it, the more it takes off of him, the more it takes off of them, and it makes their lives a lot easier. They don't feel like they have to do more because we're all doing more. We should be alleviating some of the stress and not causing so much of it. We shouldn't be calling him at 3 in the morning and sister so-and-so pissed me off or brother so-and-so said this. We have to grow up. Plain and simple. And I, 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 am, I am the chiefest of sinners. I am. Connection and choice. Today, will you choose to make connection? Will you choose to give people choices to lead them to a place where they can choose life or death, and be okay with either. Love them if they choose death. And then get on your knees where they can't see you and pray that God will have an experience with them that will utterly change their life. Because when that happens, we will be added to daily. We will have that New Testament awakening where we are added to daily. It's not up to the church's Facebook page or the church's website to draw people in. It's us. It's because we're bearing the image of Christ on this earth. That's what should be drawing people into this place. And then we have the ability to give them the option to choose, hey, I want to go deeper. We have these awesome classes that you should go to. Hey, we have these awesome small groups where you can build community with people. I want to serve. Hey, great. We have this opportunity for you to serve and help or whatever ministry. But not like stuffing that junk in their mouth as soon as they get here. Let them kind of sit, soak for a minute. Let them have that experience where they meet God face to face and like, oh man, my eyes were just open. Something, you know, something's not, something's, whoa. And they'd be like, yeah, I know what just happened to you. Let's talk about that for a minute. Let's talk about that. Let me tell you what happened with me. And then we'll have a connection. And then I can help you grow and go into these other things. Because it should be fun. It should be a joyous time. Some people are going to be laborious and tedious. I was. I was laborious and tedious. Half that gray hair belongs to me. I claim it. How the other half belongs to him. <laughs> but guys, we have, we have a responsibility. If we said yes to Jesus, we have a responsibility. It's time for us to take ownership of it and to do with it what God wants us, what he's planned for us to do with it. Amen? Amen. 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 Good job. I don't know. I wasn't paying attention. I, didn't, I don't know what time you started. <clears throat> um, I want to say something. I have uh, stepped away from the pulpit for a little bit. 
Uh, probably won't preach until the beginning of the new year. I need some time to to make some adjustments in my life and rest and recoup. So opportunities like this for me to speak, I probably will take. So uh, it's my prerogative. And since he didn't go to 1230, I got 15 minutes. I want to I want to add a little bit to what he was talking about. As I'm listening, how many of you really witness and try to convey Jesus to people? Or do you just I'm a Christian, I listen to Christian music and you go just throughout your your day. Talk about football, talk about shopping, talk about the kids, talk about just everyday life. And you just go through life and you're labeled as a Christian, but you're not communicating Jesus in 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 a in a manner of this is what the Bible says and, and this is what we need to do and this is how because in his message there's an assumption that you're doing that. Am I off? Am I, you understand what I'm trying to say? It's, there's an assumption that everybody in this room is trying to convey how to be closer to Jesus and do what Jesus wants or convey that Jesus is the way. And my question is, is how many people in here are really doing that? And as he was speaking, I was like, is this an uh, accusation against me as a pastor or the pastors in regards to our connection with the people that are coming in? And how much are we shoving in? I mean, he's making statements on stuff that I'm communicating to him and stuff that I'm communicating to the people as the process of getting people to where they're supposed to be. So I'm on guard a little bit, but I'm, then I'm, I'm kind of listening and I'm watching. And it's as it's, it's hard as is that we make connection and we convey Jesus to people. But my question is, is how many in here really do that? Because I know he does, and I know he does on Facebook, and I know in all his communication he does, but he's one of the pastors. He should. And I know Greg does, and I know Rob and Nona, and I know several others do, but how many of the congregation on their daily life do. And then of the ones that do, how many have so much mixed in with what they do of world and Christian that it's a mixed message? And I I guess what I want to add to this is I want to challenge you. He did not say get people saved. He said go make disciples. But you can't make a disciple. See, that's the problem on the other hand of it is we don't want to make, you can't make a disciple unless you make connection. You're not going to convince anybody to do something different unless you sit down with them. Unless they are so broken, they're coming to you to tell them because they've watched you for a while. And there's no connection. They're just coming to you. They've submitted completely to you because they're broken. But those, as you go along, that only happens every once in a while. If you're in a community of workplace, that only happens. Somebody only breaks down and, and comes becomes so vulnerable that they come to you and let you direct them because their life is so destroyed with the death or divorce or whatever. But on everyday life, they will only watch you. And whatever you, if you have the anointing of leadership on you, uh, uh, and if you've been made a, a Christian, you have it. Because you're in Christ, and Christ is a leader. They're going to look to you. And if they're looking to you, what are they seeing? And my challenge is, is how much of us are really getting engaged to make the connection, to make someone change, to grow them? Because you are the apostle, the prophet, the evangelist, the pastor, the teacher to the world. You are, wherever you're at. And here, in this house... We're supposed to teach you to do that out there. And the problem is is that we've made Sunday the day of evangelism. We come in here, get encouraged, and bring people in here to get them saved. This should be the day of speaking.
speaking to the troops what needs to go on. And then the classes and Wednesday night, all of that should be the preparation, the building up, the, the exercising of war to learn how to war and learn how to battle. Understand what I'm saying? All of this is I'm trying to figure out how do we do better in preparing and encouraging and getting you on our side. In other words, getting you engaged to be a soldier, getting you engaged, preparing you to be a soldier, and then getting you to go out and, and, and fight the war. How do, how do we do that better? And what he's conveying is one of the ways we've got to get better connected. But like you said, I can't, that, that's been the biggest problem is because when I, when I speak to people and I get them connected, they're connected with me and, and all that, and then when I start to move on to the next group, that group gets upset because I don't spend time with them anymore. And then there's a jealousy. But they're supposed to then take it from there and go with other people. But I'll be honest with you. Most of my fight has been with the next layer of leadership because I don't do what they want me to do. They came in, got drawn in, and I don't do it the way they wanted to do it. And they're trying to convince and convey and change the way I do it versus going out. And, and then it just becomes between us and me. A fight versus getting those that who I'm questioning. Are you making? Are you conveying Christianity to the people? So how do I make it? How do I how do I get people to get in on the fight and make a change and move from immaturity, depend uh, codependency to independency and standing on your own and conveying Christ. That that that's my dilemma. That's that's my heart. How do I how to do, do that? Do we do we become a, a, a Joel Olstein church that is just come in here and make you feel good and get, have it just loaded up with people? The the strong conservative Christians would say no. The liberal Christians would say yes. Well, why can't we do that and then convert them to the next group and get them further in? That's a big net. They're better than those in the world, right? At least they're saying, hey, there's a change that needs to be happening. These are just muses in my head, okay? I'm not trying to beat you up. I'm just, this is what I fight. This is what I go through. How, how do we make that connection? Because, it, like, and then I'm, I'm going to use you, baby. She's, 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 she's struggling. She, she came to the Lord. She's been torn back and forth. I, I communicate to her all the time, trying to get her back in. But, but how much time am I spending with her? But I got 40 of her. How, 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 and then I got to run the church. So I don't really spend enough time with her like I did with Michael. See where I'm going? I need the pastors to do that. And then I need you to help the pastors. Because Andlin, there was a connection, but who else in here that I didn't make a connection with? It just personalities, what... Shy. What, what y'all don't know is I'm an introvert. I know it doesn't look like it, but I'm an introvert. I, I'd rather be in my cave away from people. But when I get here, anointing hits me, and I'm changed. That's why when I step away, I hardly ever talk. I have a hard time just going up to people. But when the anointing hits me, then I go. And I want to close with this. You've got to get in the game. You're needed. I've, I've been preaching that for two years. I need you. We need you. God needs you. You are needed. You have people in your life that need you, but you've got to know the word. You don't have to be perfect. You just got to know some and keep practicing and keep learning and keep going. You can't stay on the knowledge. You can't eat that one piece of bread for the rest of your life. That one message, if you keep preaching it, they're eventually going to say, I'm done. You've got to have more. But you've got to spend time with people. You've got to communicate. You've got to connect with them. You can't just preach at them. You've got to live life. And this is what I'm going to close with. The Halloween situation that ticked so many people off. See, the thing is, is that you can't convince people from in, in, in Facebook truths. 
And you can't change people. You can't convert people. And we try to do it from there, and there's no connection. And this is the truth, and this is the reality. I want everybody to look at me. There's three different people in that scenario. Those, those that are not saved, and those that are saved, but don't have knowledge, and then those that are mature and know the truth of the word. And there's a little bit in between each one of those stages, but that's the three stages. And you cannot preach a truth into the, uh, into the world stage about Halloween and expect people to see it. I learned that the hard way. This is the truth. You are in this church. That means you have stated, I am a true believer. I'm coming in. If you're not, and you're just coming here for the first time, uh, just bear with me. I'm not trying to condemn. I'm trying to show. The truth is that the, the holiday of Halloween, if you research and allow the Holy Ghost to, to, to lead you, you will see that what goes on there opens the doors to things in your life that destroy your life. That's the truth. I was led by the Holy Ghost to see all of that and understand all of that, okay? And as a minister of the gospel, as he imparts that to me, it is my responsibility to break that down and feed that to you. That's what I'm called to do. But that does not mean that you are called to take that same word and spread it to the world. Now, the mature person can open up and see that because in Halloween, th these are the two truths. One, it celebrates death and lust. Okay? And in those two things, it opens doors. And then there's a whole bunch more in it, but that's just this, this, this the one side. The person right here that is a Christian that has been saved that has not come into that reality and come to that truth does not know, and he's not in sin if he celebrates in that. The, world, the person in the world has no idea of truth, and he's not in sin because he doesn't know anything about that. The person that that has been given the reality of the truth, if he participates, he's in sin because he's gotten revelation of it, and he knows what has been told to him. He cannot then participate. But that does not put him in a judgment seat. He has, not, he has a speck in his eye, I mean a beam in his eye, if he tries to go remove a speck. He needs to remove the beam from his own eye before he tries to remove the speck from somebody else's eye. And so the person that is saved and knows I have to spend time with and begin to break down the scripture and piece by piece start giving him meat, not milk anymore. The person out here in the, the world I have to give milk to to get them inside the house. And in social media, we're throwing out T-bone steaks and people are choking on it. And therefore, all it does is cause a fight and a teardown. And so in his communication, in his pastor, I mean, in his, his preaching today, that's what he's talking about. You take a cow. It takes the, uh, the, the plant to kill that cow, gut it, and send it on its way. And then the butcher, he cuts it down in pieces, and then mom gets it. Then she trims it up and cooks it. And then you give it to, your, to, to everybody else. And then this is the key. When you become mature enough, you cut it. You don't shove that whole steak in your mouth. You cut it piece by piece and take pieces. Now, what do we do to children? At first, they don't even get the steak. They get, uh, uh, they get the, 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 the mashed potatoes that got a little bit of the steak gravy on it, right? And then you, when, when they get a little older, you cut the steak in very small pieces, and you give them little pieces at a time, right? And then as they get older, then they get their own little piece, Right? And then as they grow older, they have more and more. And then when you get my age, you eat big, bloody, 32-ounce. Ribeyes. Right? So all of those are just foods for thought. Uh, uh, we have to be wise. We have to know who our audience is, who we're communicating. We are the brokers of peace. But listen, guys, 
Just because we're the brokers of peace do not, does not mean that we do not have confrontation. There is going to be confrontation, but there's also going to be you do not cast your pearls before swine. That's why you have to have the Holy Ghost and you have to have spend time with him to know what you're to do. Because in those three scenarios, which one is it? Because I don't know. I could have three people that look the same, and I don't know which one they are. Only the Holy Ghost knows who they are. Right? I may not know what's going on in this situation. Only the Holy Ghost knows. I have to be led by it. What should I say? What should I do? Should I confront? Should I hold my pearls and not cast them? Should I address? Should I be hard? Should I be soft? Because Janie needs it hard, and, 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 and Ralph wants a soft approach. She's in your face. Get it out. Get it done and go. Ralph, slow and let's talk about it. Me and Annette, just let's get it out, rip the band-aid off, and let's go. But that's what, that's Christians. You know, each person is going to be different. How do you know that besides the Holy Ghost? Relationship. Relationship. Who got you saved? wasn't a stranger. It was somebody you knew that spent time with you that you, that you trusted to convey the gospel. So my question is this. How much time are you spending with the, with the Lord? How much are you conveying to other people? And how, I mean, how much time are you spending with other people? And then what are you conveying to them? You're needed. You're called. He didn't just say... Uh, all pastors, all, uh, all, all the fivefold, all the leadership of the church, you're called to do it. He, every one of us is called. And you're going to be account accountable to it. He's going to ask you. He's going to look you dead in the eye. How much did you convey my love to other people? Let's bow our heads. Father, I thank you for your word today. And I, I just uh, want to apologize to you, Father, for stepping out of my role and whining. Father, help me to be strong again. Help me to be encouraging. Help me to teach, be wise in all that I do, and convey your love, but convey your truths. Then, Father, help each person in here to feel confident in you, that they build their relationship with you. And then, Father God, show them the relationships that they are to convey to that they're to speak to, that they're to connect with and teach Jesus to the people that they're supposed to teach Jesus to. Father, thank you for this word today, and let us apply it in Jesus' name. Amen. Shake hands. Hug next. Don't get mixed up. We'll see you Wednesday. Please, if you can.